Please join me as we go before our Lord. Dear Lord, thank you so very much. Thank you for today. Thank you for this moment. Thank you for everything, dear Lord. Lord, there are so many praises, so many opportunities, uh, Lord, for us to see your hand at work. And so often we, re we, we deny seeing it. We, we just act like it didn't happen. We just, man, we just, we just, man, we just don't even acknowledge it. It's like, well, he's, that's what he's supposed to do. And why do we need to say anything? We just need to come to him when we need help. And Lord, that's not true. It's not accurate. It's not biblical it's not not what you desire dear lord you want to hear our voice in all things and everything and so lord we want to rift, lift up the roof to you today we want to praise your name dear lord we want thank you for all that you've done for us already all that you continue to do thank you for for the the um uh Hodgkin's lymphoma not being Hodgkin's lymphoma, Lord, that your hand was on that. Even the, the experts that know that that know this knew that it was it, and you said, no, it's not. And so we thank you for that, dear Lord. We thank you. We, we praise your name in that. We thank you, dear Lord, for the, the growth that Jordan talked about in this congregation, in this family, dear Lord, the way that this family is not afraid to lift up in prayer, but also not afraid to lift up in praise not just requests, but also in thanksgiving. And so, Father, we just thank you for that. We ask you to continue to help us to continue to grow in that direction that we would not change, that that would not change at all, Lord, that, that would we would just continue to grow in that direction, that we would have your heart, dear Lord, and that we'd be thankful for the heart that you give us. Lord, we uh, ask that uh, you, would, uh, you, you would be with uh, Linda's friend, uh, um, Diane, as, as she's going through this chemo and the other health issues that she's already got going on, she's got this cancer going on now. On top of that, we ask for your hand on her. We ask for your hand on on uh, um, Becky's uh, granddaughter, on Becky and her granddaughter and and her children and, and all the family around them uh, as, as uh, the granddaughter is going through this cancer as well, dear Lord. We ask for your healing hand. We know that you could, re you could heal. You could take it away. You could right now just like that. You could do what you did with Pastor Kyle. Uh, but, but, Lord, we don't know what your plan is. And we ask for your plan above all things. Jesus said in the garden, he said, uh, take this cup from me, but, but not my will, your will. And, and, Lord, we say the same, but we know, we know we can have a say in it. So, Lord, we ask, we ask that you would, you would take away the cancer. You would heal. You would prosper, dear Lord. We ask for that. We ask for continued growth. We ask for these things, dear Lord, because you tell us to come to you with all prayers and all requests, all of our petitions, dear Lord. Um, and, Lord, so we, we do ask for that. We ask for your hand on the medical teams that as, as they go through um, – uh, these cancer treatments and all this stuff that's going to go on with, with these people, uh, just ask that with Diane and, and with also with the granddaughter, just ask that um, you would have your hand on them, that you would lead, guide them, but also lead, guide the care teams, those who are taking care of the, the doctors, the nurses, the, the everybody all the way down the line, the manufacturers, as a matter of fact, dear Lord, and but the people that clean in the room, it doesn't matter, whoever, whoever anyone from mopping the floor to doing the, the intricate surgery, dear Lord, we ask for your hand upon them. You gave them the gift and ability that they have. You gave them every gift and ability they have. <clears throat> we ask that you help them to remember that, dear Lord, that they would not forget. Dear Lord, we just ask for your hand on that. Lord, we ask for your hand on the McCoy family. We ask for your hand on them as, as they've lost uh, Dana to this motorcycle accident. He's young. None of us, none of us decide, oh, it was a snowmobile accident, excuse me. None of us desire to bury our child. There is nothing that seems more out of place than that, Lord. But, Lord, in this, it happens. And so we just ask that you have your hand on uh, Rob and, and the whole family, on the entire McCoy family, dear Lord, as they walk through this time. Lord, we also ask for your hand on, on uh, the Boss family as, as, as they continue to mourn for uh, Henrietta, dear Lord, what we ask is that you would help each of these families. You you would help them with wisdom, with guidance through this time, unity through this time, dear Lord. We ask though that that uh, you help them to mourn well. It's important for us to mourn, and anyone who thinks that you don't need to mourn is wrong. Even you mourn; your son mourns. Father, we 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 ask that you would help them to mourn well we ask that you would walk with them dear lord and that that lord they would come together not come apart and father just raise them up to you right now that your hand would be on them you'd you'd guide them through this time but we also ask as that mourning period comes to an end we ask for your healing hand your healing hand on those broken hearts on those struggles 
the challenges that come through these things. Father God, we ask for your hand on them. So Father God, we just ask all these things, Lord, we ask them in Jesus' loving and beautiful name. And we also come to you with the prayer that he taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen. And I would ask that as we walk through a week, some of us are we're prayer warriors, right? And some of us were not so much on the prayer warrior thing, right? But I would ask that any of these prayers, all of these prayers, that you would continue to pray for them throughout the course of the week, right? Especially the ones with this ongoing, the cancer, the mourning, that sort of thing. Um, and you don't have to do it in front of anyone. You don't have to do any special prayer, right? Maybe it's a matter of, uh, Lord, oh yeah, Diane, if you would help Diane. Right, if you you'd have your hand on Diane for that cancer, right? Whatever he prompts you to say, uh, to to pray, he knows what you're thinking. He knows what you're asking. Technically, you don't have to ask it, except for he says that we're supposed to bring our petitions to him, right? And so, just want to share that with you today. That that as as we go, um, and I've, I've done this a couple times, reminding you of that because because it's so important. That prayer, that prayers, the prayers that Pastor Kyle had uh, going over him were huge. Our prayer team was praying for him. He had prayer teams, I don't even know where all at, that were praying for him. There's a lot, a lot, a lot of people praying for him. He's, he pastors a very large church. A lot of prayers going out for him. Those prayers are answered. But if nobody prays, God can't answer that prayer. See what I'm saying? And so when things go well, right, when, when we get the praise report as well, please remember to pray those as well. Thank you, Lord. Those should be really easy. Those should be the super easy ones, right? I mean, right? And so, so uh, anyway, um, just, uh, and I know, like I say, some people, you're just, not, you're just not a prayer. And I'm sorry for that. But as your heart grows with the Lord, you'll become one. But you'll never become one if you don't practice one. Okay? So, anyway, um, so, do, question for you. We're, we're on the third week of this series already. I can't believe it. Two weeks ago, we talked about, let's go, right? We are just like, let's kick her in gear. Let's get it going, right? Let's start out, right? Uh, we'll get through this. God will get you through this, right? And then uh, last week, we talked about what goes up must come down. And this week, we're going to talk about alone, but not really, okay? We're, we, we feel alone, but not really. We're not alone, okay? Um, do you remember the, the, the can you remember the, like the, the epitome, the peak, the, your, your best, best memory Maybe it was graduating high school. Maybe it was graduating college. Maybe it was graduating kindergarten. I don't know what it was, but, right? Um, maybe it was when you got married. That you said, I do, to that best friend that you still have and will have for the rest of your life. Maybe it was that, right? Maybe it was one of those things. I don't know what it was, but, but do you remember that? Maybe it was, maybe it was that, that first grandchild when you held your, your or a child, I mean, when you first held that very first child in your arms and you're like, God, it only took nine months. This went like that. Of course, your wife is over there going, oh no, it took a little more, <laughs> you know, but right. But, but that maybe that you're going this miracle, this creation that man living is so cool. Maybe that's your ultimate, ultimate memory, right? That's your top memory. We all have them. Those are easy usually to come up with, right? Um, how about that, that low memory? That, that bottom, that memory you just, you'd rather that you didn't have to remember. Maybe it's the loss of someone. Maybe it's the death. Maybe it's, maybe it's that, that positive uh, cancer test, right? Maybe, it's, maybe the scans came back and no, it wasn't good. It wasn't what we hoped for. It wasn't what we were praying for. Maybe it was that. Maybe it was the loss of a, of a loved one. Maybe a spouse, maybe a parent, maybe a child, maybe a grandchild. Right? I mean, so we, usually we, we could pick those out pretty good too, the ones that we really don't want to have, but, but they're there. There are valleys. They're there, right? We all experience what, all the ups. We all experience the downs. But I would contend this. Most of us live in that mid-altitude, that midway range more than that, right? Like, the, like just the, 
the mundane stuff. You know, oh, we got the expense report to do. We got we got the carpool. We got the you know what I mean. That, that, that kind of stuff. What's for dinner? You know, just the mundane. Most of us live in that sort of thing. We don't live in the highs and the lows. But but um, on occasion, the world bottoms out on us, and we end up down in the bottom of that valley. We end up in that place where we're broken and we're raw, right? Genesis 39, verse 1 through 5, as we continue our story with Joseph. Now Joseph had been taken down to Egypt. Potiphar, an Egyptian who was one of Pharaoh's officials, the captain of the guard, bought him from the Ishmaelites who had taken, had taken him there. The Lord was with Joseph so that he prospered, and he lived in the house of his Egyptian master. When his master saw that the Lord was with him and that the Lord gave him success in everything he did, Joseph found favor in his, in his eyes and became his attendant. Potiphar put him on, in charge of his household, and he entrusted to his care everything he owned. From the time he put him in charge of his household and of all that he owned, the Lord blessed the household of the Egyptian because of Joseph. The blessing of the Lord was on everything Potiphar had, both in the house and in the field. Joseph discovered what the auction block of Egypt was like, and it wasn't a high for him. Joseph discovered that for the second time, for the second time, his life is being sold away. For the second time, he's being traded in for cash. For the second time, for the second time, the favorite son of Jacob is being picked and prodded over. He's, he's being checked out for lice and fleas. He's been uh, poking. They're just checking to see his health, to see if he's worth buying or not. He's being treated like an animal, no better than an animal. In fact, probably even worse than an animal, right? For the second time, he's there. And Potiphar, this Egyptian officer, the, the man in charge of Pharaoh's security team, um, uh, purchases Joseph and takes him. Joseph doesn't know the language. He doesn't know the culture. The food is strange, probably doesn't taste as good as his, right? He, do, he doesn't know what's going on. He doesn't understand, but he's got one thing. Even though he has all these things that he does not have, he, there's all these things that he does not have, He's still got his God. Because, see, normally we would look at this and we're like, man, he sold into slavery a second time. Man, he's, he's been thrown in the pit by his brothers. He's been abused by his brothers. He's been, he's been sold off. He's been sold to the, 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 the gypsies. He's been sold off now. He's being sold off to Potiphar. Man, in our world today, what do we do? We, we anticipate what? We anticipate someone's going down a drain. We anticipate there's going to be a drug problem, an alcohol problem. We're going to have the depression. We're going to have the anxiety. We're going to have the anger. We're going to have the despair, right? In our world today, that's what happens with most people. And so we automatically kind of think, oh, no, now what's going to happen? We just think about more negative, more negative. But here's the thing, see? It wasn't negative for him. The next story, or the next chapter of Joseph's life isn't despair, it, it, it's not that, it, what it is, is, is that Joseph remembers the one thing that's most important to him, and that is that God is with him. See, God was with Joseph, and Joseph remembered God is with Joseph. And therefore, Joseph did not delve deeper. He did not dig a deeper hole. He did not dig a new pit. He did not give himself away to Satan and what he would have him do. See, this is where Joseph's story splits from the story of the world that we live in today. Because today, what do we do? We've got things going on. and what do we, oh, Get a self-help book. Let's go find some, some, some do-it-yourself kind of thing. Oh, dig deeper. Dig deeper. Get in there. It's something in you. You've got to find the strength. Pull up your big boy pants. Come on, let's go. But the reality is that's not it. Joseph says, no, go higher. Let's look higher. Let's look up. Let's look to the Lord. Let's look to our Creator. That's what Joseph says. Everything he does, he continues to focus on God. So when we think that everything is gone, we've lost everything. We have. Maybe, maybe your spouse said, maybe she said, guess what? It's over. We're through. And you found your stuff by the curb. Right? Maybe that's what happened. Maybe it's, it, it's during that low time and someone has died. Someone has been, been diagnosed with that cancer. They, they, those, those ugly things, those lows that we have, when we're in those lows, when maybe, maybe we've gone into our own Egypt, maybe we've been sold down the river into our own Egypt, maybe now all of our friends are gone, our money's gone, everything, we have nothing left, but hey, gone. Because we have one thing left, God is left. God is left. He's still there with you. He's still there with you. Psalm 139, verse 7 through 10. Where can I go from your spirit? 
Where can I flee from your presence? If I go up to the heavens, you are there. If I make up my bed in the depths, you are there. If I rise on the wings of the dawn, if I settle on the far side of the sea, even there your hand will guide me. Your right hand will hold me fast. No matter where we are, God is there. He still got us. And his right hand is still holding us fast. So maybe Joseph's version of Psalm 139, his version maybe would be more like, where can I go? Where can I, where can I uh, uh, get away from your spirit? Where, where, uh, if I go to the bottom of the pit or the top of the auction block, where do I go? If I go to a stranger's home, if, I, if I'm sold into a stranger's home, into a different strange country, yet you're still there. Yet you're still there and you still have a hold of me. Right? Maybe, maybe your story. Maybe you're Egypt, maybe where you're at. Maybe it's like, Lord, I don't, no matter where I go, no matter where I go, whether I could, where can I go to get away from your spirit, right? Where can I go to get away from your spirit? I, man, if I go to, if I go to uh, um, rehab or if I go to ICU or if I go to, if I go to uh, uh, the, the homeless shelter or if I go, if I end up in jail, where can I go that you're not? He's still there. No matter where you're at. He would still guide us. We have to let him. We have to be willing to. We have to look to him. But he will still guide us. No matter where we're at, no matter what pit, no, no matter what depth, no matter what Egypt we're in, what, what slavery we're in, we will never go where God is not. We will never go where God is not. He is everywhere. He is everywhere. How can I know that? Easy. Acts 17, verse 27. God did this so that they would seek him and perhaps reach out for him and find him, though he is not far from any one of us, for in him we live and move and have our being. No matter where we are, he is near us. No matter where we are, he is with us. The difference is if we're stiff-arming him or linking arms with him, right? That's where the difference comes in. No matter what, he's there. God doesn't play favorites. He, don't, he's, he doesn't favor, favor the cities over the farms or vice versa. He doesn't, he doesn't favor what we, we call Midwest what? God's country. He doesn't favor the Midwest over New York City. I'm just telling you straight up. He doesn't favor the wealthy over the poor. He doesn't favor the white over the black. He doesn't favor the, the American over the Iranian. He doesn't favor any of that. He doesn't favor the male over the female. He does not favor anyone over anyone. He doesn't favor... His presence is always there, and we can all enjoy his presence no matter where we're at. No matter what desert we're in, no matter what Egypt we're in, no matter what pit we're in, no matter where we're at, he's there. He's with us. He wants to strengthen us. He wants to lead us. He wants to guide us. The problem is so many people refuse that. They deny that. They reject him. And when he's trying to, he, they think, as he's trying to lift them up, they're thinking they've got to do it all on their own. They listen to them stupid self-help books where it's all about you. Just do it. It's all in you. It's your thing. You just reach deeper. And God's there going, come on, I'm right here. Yet they reject God. They deny God. They say, there ain't no way. God can't be here because why would I be in this pit if he was here? Why would I be going through this if he was here? Why would, why would the McCoys lose their little child, their, their, their school-aged child, why would they lose him if God was there? If God was there, he wouldn't have let him die. If he, God was there, this little, little infant would not be having cancer. If God was there, that's what they say. The reality is God is there. The problem is they're rejecting him. No matter what they're doing, they're rejecting him. When they turn away from him, he's there. But so many think they have to do it on their own strength, of their own power, of their own way, and refuse to turn to God. But we do have Moseses around too, right? We don't have to live the godless life. We have, we have Moses around, right? See, he's, he's a whole lot uh, um, like Joseph. See, Joseph, Joseph uh, uh, stuck to God, and, and Moses uh, stuck to God. He stuck to what God called him to do, right? Um, um, suddenly, Moses ha- has the responsibility of two million ex-slaves. And he's like, um, 
how do I take care of them? Right? What, what am I going to do to help them survive? How do I protect them? How do I defend them? How do I, how do I raise them up? And he turns to God, and God gives us an answer. Exodus 33, verse 15, then Moses said to him, if you're, uh, um, well, let me back that up. See, God, because God t- tells him, God tells him just before this, God tells him as he's asking, when he's asking God, he's saying, where, you know, what's going on? God says, hey, I'm with you. Keep your eyes here. Let's keep focused, right? I'm with you. I will go with you. I will always be present. And then Moses responds with this. Exodus 33, verse 15. Then Moses said to him, If your presence does not go with us, do not send us up from here. How will anyone know that you are pleased with me and with your people unless you go with us? What else will distinguish me and your people from all the other people on the face of the earth? What distinguishes you and I from the rest of the people on the earth? God distinguishes us. Our faith in the Lord from all those who don't believe. God faces a, uh, uh, God, God sets us apart from everyone else. Now, if we we um, if if we look at King David, another one who preferred life with God to life without God, right? Um, King David, um, he ended up in his own Egypt, his his Egypt of his own making. See, remember he he stole the wife, he 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 seduced the wife of one of his one of his. Uh, um, one of his friends he seduces the wife away from one of his friends and when she gets pregnant what's he do he tries to cover it up with murder and deceit he tries to he tries to he runs for a year he runs away from god for a year but ultimately ultimately he turns back and he repents to the lord and he repents, and there's one thing, what, what happens when he, finally, when he finally confesses his immorality to the Lord, there's one request that he has of God. And that's in Psalm 51, verse 11. Do not cast me from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me. Do not cast me from your presence. Or take, he didn't say, don't take my kingdom. He didn't say, don't take my crown. He didn't say, don't take my army. Don't take this woman I just seduced into my, into my bed. He didn't say anything about that. Don't, don't, don't take the child. He didn't say any of that. He said, don't take your presence and Holy Spirit from me. He knew what was most important. He knew what was most important. We have to make God's presence your passion. You have to make God's presence your passion. His presence in our life has to be of utmost concern for us. It has to be more important than anything else. So how do we do that? That's a great question. We need to be more like a sponge than a rock. We need to be more like a sponge than a rock. Think about this. A rock, what do you do? You put it in the water, and what happens? The outside gets wet, but the inside stays hard and dry. A sponge put in that same water, and the sponge transforms. Every pore of that sponge soaks up that water. Every, that sponge is no longer the same as what it was before, but it's filled throughout with that water. We have a choice. We have a choice. We can either be a rock or we can be a sponge. It's up to us. We can either be hard and unchanged and only sprinkled with the Spirit, or we can be like a sponge and open every pore of our being to the Holy Spirit and allow him to lead us and guide us and allow, allow him to permeate us through and throughout. So we can, we can resist, resist or we can receive the Holy Spirit. We can, we can forgive or, or we can blame. We can be imprisoned or we can have the freedom of the Holy Spirit. It's our choice what we want to do. But one thing that we must do what I, what I encourage you, you must do this, is lay claim to the nearness of God. Lay claim to the nearness of God. God is so close. He's with us, all around us, ever present. And we need to lay claim to that. He wants us to. Hebrews 13, verse 5, Never will I leave you, never will I forsake you. Never will I leave you, never will I forsake you. God will never leave you. He will never forsake you, no matter what you're going through, no matter what pitch you're in, no matter what... What 
problem you've got going on, no matter what auction block you're on, no matter what part of Egypt you're in, no matter what desert you're in, He's always near us, and we need to understand that, and we need to embrace that. His presence is with you. His presence, God's presence, is with you, and it will always be with you. He's always there. Job uh, might have might have understood this uh, um, as much as, as well as anyone. See, because sometimes it feels like God's presence isn't there, doesn't it? There's those times, right? And, and Job felt in, in Job 23, verse 8 through 10, but, it, but if I go to the east, he is not there. If I go to the west, I do not find him. When he is at the work in the north, I do not see him. When he turns to the south, I catch no glimpse of him. See, Job felt far from God. He felt like he was all on his own. He didn't, he didn't really feel God's presence with him, right? But he knew this. He knew verse 10. But he knows the way that I take when he has tested me. I will come forth as gold. He knows the way that I can't see him. I don't feel him. I don't, I, man, I'm just like, I know he's there, but I can't, I just don't know where. But he knows that I stay true to him. He knows that he is my God. He knows I'm not going anywhere else. He knows that Jesus is my Lord and Savior. He knows that I know that Jesus is my Lord and Savior. I have claimed that Jesus is my Lord and Savior. I claim my God to be close to me, near to me. My God will never leave me. He knows that, and I will continue to walk in the way of the Lord, the way the Holy Spirit leads me to go. I will continue to do that. And when I do, God knows where I'm at. He knows what path I'm on. And when he tests me, after this testing, when he, when he checks on me, guess what? I'm going to be pure as gold. I won't be broken. I'll be refined. And I'll be pure as gold. That's what he's saying. We need to not equate the presence of God with our feelings. Do not equate the presence of God with your feelings. Man, we can feel all kinds of stuff. And Satan likes it when we start feeling all kinds of stuff. He loves it because he can tear us up. God's near us whether we're happy or not. Oh, God must have left me. I've had people tell me that. Oh, God must have left me. He must have abandoned me. I must have done something to really... I used to say, yeah, I must have done something to really make him mad. Because I don't feel him anywhere around. I'm pretty sure I'm on my own here. When I was lost. When I was lost, I was there. I understand it. But he's never left me. And when I learned that, when I understand that, when I, when I figured that out, when I got in here, and I got this in here, when I got into Scripture and got Scripture into me, when I got into relationship, when I started that praying thing I was talking about, right? When I started praying with God, not praying at God, not just requesting stuff, but thanking Him for stuff, and just even just talking and like, Lord, what you got for me today? Right? I'm like, yeah, come on. And when I started having those conversations, when I gained a real relationship with God, not that fake thing, that thing that, you know, you go to the bank and you go, how are you doing today, young lady? And she's like, oh, great. And then you just drive away. Now, I don't do that, but I know there's a lot of people who do that, right? Oh, man, you can ask my kids and my wife. I don't do that. <laughs> um, but, you know, I, I don't ask people because I, just because, well, just to raise conversation. I ask them because I care, right? But when I have that relationship with God, because I have that relationship with God, now I know he's here, he's with me. But what we need to do, we need to get in here. Problem is most of us don't get in here. We don't get in here. Pastor said on Sunday morning, that's all the more I got to do. I read that meme on, on Facebook. That's all I got to do. It was a scripture. I had a scripture today. But we do not get in here, and this cannot get in here if we don't get in there. It can't happen. But when we do, when we get in here, we can refine some really good gold in here. We can refine some godly gospel gold in here. We can refine some, some things for us to hold on to. Right? Okay, so, so like, um, let's say, mm, he knows my name. God, it's in here. God knows my name. He knows your name. I don't care who you are, the newest to the oldest. The, it doesn't matter. The nicest to the meanest. The most righteous to the most unrighteous. He knows your name. He knows every one of our names. That's pretty impressive. 
That's pretty impressive stuff. How about this? Uh, the angels still respond to his call. Did you know that? Guess what? They responded to his call before. They still respond to his call. That's never changed. It's in here. You know what? The, the, we might not like the rules of our world right now. We got some that are kind of cuckoo for Cocoa Puff right now, right? We, we might think that, right? And I mean, trust me, the one you're thinking of isn't the one your neighbor's thinking of. Okay? Let's be honest, because every ruler in this world, I guarantee you, someone else thinks they're cuckoo for Cocoa Puff. Right? But the reality is, guess what? The rulers of the world still yield to God. They can't do a thing without God. Even the things we think are totally and completely evil and wicked, God has a plan and a purpose. Our scriptures tell us that the rulers still yield to him and his will. Heaven's only a heartbeat away. It's true. It's right in here. Guess what? The grave is just a rental space. It's just a short-term rental. That's all it is. It says so right in here. It says so right in here. God still does everything for our good and his glory. It's in here. He does everything for our good and his glory. When we refine this, that we have those golden nuggets that on those days when everything seems like, I don't know where he's at, I don't got it, I don't, man, I, what a mess. When we think we're in the lowest of the low pits, these little gold nuggets will get us through. These little gold nuggets will remind us he's still with us. He's ever present. He's always with us. And he's always got our best in his interest. What's best for The problem is, right, how often do we think that, well, but the best would be if I was a millionaire. And God says, no, that'd just destroy you. But he doesn't love me because I'm not a millionaire. No, because he loves you, you're not a millionaire. And you can take any scenario you want in life, and you can claim, he must not love me. But the reality is, because he loves you, is why you're where you're at. He's refining you. And there's some pretty challenging times that we're going through right now. This last, the last few years in this country has been kind of tumultuous, hasn't it? And it's getting more tumultuous all around the world, isn't it? Right? And in these times, we should, we should be trying to draw together in unity. The reality is there's been more division over the last half decade to a decade. There's been more division in this country than ever. I mean, like, it's unbelievable compared to what it was before. There's nothing, nothing even close to where we're at. And especially today, we just continue to be more and more divided. The reality is in this time, we should be wanting to come together. But the reality is instead, we scatter we become hermits. We, come, we, we get off by ourselves. Oh, no, I'm doing my thing over here. I ain't going near them. Right? And, and that's the total opposite of what we should be doing. We need to be coming together. I want to encourage you this. When we're in that, that ugly space, we're in that pit, we're on that road to Egypt, we're in our master's house, our slave owner's house, when we're there, I want to encourage you this to pray your pain out. Pray your pain out. Pound the table. Make some noise. Pound your feet. Stomp your feet up and down the hall. It's fine. Shout at the top of your lungs. Let the Lord know. It's okay. It's okay. In fact, our scripture, our scripture shows us that it's okay. I don't know if you remember Jeremiah or not. But see, Jeremiah was called the wailing prophet. Jeremiah, he was, during his, his time of prophecy, he pastored Jerusalem during, during an economic, I mean, everything was an economic ter, uh, turmoil, a uh, collapse, really. Um, there was the political upheaval of the time. There was the, the invasion, the disaster, the exile, all that, all this death and all that stuff going on. And Jeremiah wept, but he shouted as well. He raised the roof. He wasn't afraid to raise his complaints. In fact, the reason the book of Lamentations is called Lamentations is because he lamented. His, it's his prayer journal. And his prayer journal was all about lamenting what was going on. Lamenting means he's wailing out to God. Okay? Lamentations 3, verse 1 through 8. I am the man who has 
seen affliction by the rod of the Lord's wrath. He has driven me away and made me walk in darkness rather than light. Indeed, he has turned his hand against me again and again all day long. He has, he has made my skin and my flesh grow old and has broken my bones. He has besieged me and, and surrounded me with bitterness and hardship. He has made me dwell in darkness like those long dead. He has walled me in so I cannot escape. He has weighed me down with chains. Even when I call out or cry for help, he shuts out my prayer. Does Jeremiah sound like he's in a good mood? Jeremiah's wailing. <clears throat> he's mad. He's frustrated. He's a little hot under the collar. And it's okay. We, we look at him and go, man, he was all mad at God. Why was he mad at God? Well, I don't think he was wrong. I've got to be honest with you. Well, we can't be mad at God. No, we shouldn't be mad at God. You're right. But our anger should go to God. He should know it because he does. No matter what you're thinking, no matter what you're going through, whether it's your sorrow, your sorrow, your anger, your whatever it is, whatever upheaval it is in your life, whatever turmoil you got going on, whatever pit you're in, it doesn't matter. God already knows it. So when you lie to God and go, oh, God, everything's great today. Thanks. It was a beautiful day. And in reality, it really sucked. All you're doing is lying to God. Problem is, he already knows. And you'd be far better off if you'd be honest with him. Just tell him the truth. God's got broad shoulders, folks. His word tells us, tells us to come to him. Tells us in good or bad, doesn't matter. In praise or, or in a petition, doesn't matter. He tells us to come to him in what? Just the things that we want, just the things he might find interesting and good, right? No, no, he says come in all things. We're to come to him with all things. He's there for us in all things. Not just the good, not just the bad, not just when we're mad at him, but and not just when we want to praise him. Not just when we need, 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 need. But in all things. So when we do this, I did this for two years. I, I relate, to, out of all the prophets, I relate to Jeremiah better than any. I've shared with you two years I spent in a desert. I was spent in, in turmoil, I, an argument with God. Okay, I was arguing. He's up there going, all right, you about done throwing your temper tantrum? You know what I mean? But, but the reality is this. That last year of that, that time, that frustration, that trials that I was going through, the testing I was going through, that last year that uh, when I worked at, because I still worked at the plant up there then, right? Um, I, had, I, I would go to the backyard of the plant, back in the back 40 we called it. I'd be out there, and I'm out there. I'm not even kidding you. I'm like, I don't get it. What is it you want me to do? I'm frustrated. Help me to hear. I don't know what it is you want. And it wasn't any quieter than that. That's why I went way back there. Not all The other 40 guys didn't have to go, oh, he's cuckoo for Cocoa Puffs. You know what I'm saying? But that's where I would go, and I would just like, oh. And I would also, when I was on walks or, or out and about, I would be like, man, I don't get it. People see me in the car, they're like, he's really jamming to the music. No, I'm in there going, I don't get it. You know? And they're thinking I'm singing some new song. <laughs> it must be a Christian song. He's, you know, he's asking questions. <laughs> so, right? But I get it, and God gets it, and he wants us to come to him. He wants us to come to him. Here's what we need to do. We've got to stop trying to walk through this life by ourselves because we can't do it. We're not designed for it. We're not called to it. God calls us to come together. Here's what we need to do. We need to find someone we can confide in, someone we can be honest and open with, someone we will give permission to hold us accountable, someone to walk with us through the stuff of life. Now, there are people that you should not share things with, there are people that are unsafe for you to share things with. I get that. But you know what I find interesting? Is we're all part of the bride. And I find it, I've, I, it I struggle with, so, so I'm sick. I'm, I'm just like, I'm just, I pretty much feel like I'm dying. I'm just going to go out here to the field. I'm not going to go to the hospital. I'll just go out here. I'll sit in nature. People don't do that. 
right? You go to the hospital, right? I mean, come on. I mean, why would we do that? Instead, we, 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 we just go, we try to do things on our own, and that's what this world has done over and over again. Christians are doing that. They're like, nope, forget it. I'm not going to church. Nope, I'm not going. There's people there. I don't like people no more. I'm mad. I'm going to go on my own. I'm going to do my own thing. I'll do it on my own. God, no. God calls us to come together. See, if we meet someone, if, if we go and we meet for coffee, right? Jesus says, where two or three are gathered in my name, I will also be there, right? Hello, that's in here. That's part of them nuggets that we find. He'll be with us. You don't have to have the congregation. But by golly, you got to have someone. And if you're trying to be a Christian, if you're walking that path, if you're saying you're following Jesus Christ, if you're saying the Holy Spirit's leading you, then you need to get together with another Christian person that will help hold you accountable. And yet, today, people are spewing from the church. They're all running in every direction. They're all leaving. They're, they're just flowing. It's like a sieve. And why are they doing it? They're going out to do their own thing even though we're called to come together. And this building is not the church. Remember, the people are the church, right? People following God, following Jesus Christ, listen to the Holy Spirit, people are the church. The body coming together, that's the church. And we need to come together as the body. People just keep abandoning it. That's why we have life groups. That's why we have them. So small groups of people can get together and grow together and walk together. We don't do life groups to study flowers, right? Life groups get together, we study scripture, and we walk together, we become a a family. And yet, what have we done? Life groups are getting smaller and smaller all the time, withering, dying, Yet I have people, oh, man, if we had a life group, oh, I'd like to have a life group. But it's got to be this day, this time. That's the only time that's going to work for me. Then start one. That's why I'll promote a life group in any way. Anyone who wants any, any resources for their life group, guess what? We'll buy the kit. We'll get it started if you want to do a study of something. Well, the church will buy it. We want to build our library. If we don't already have it, you can. U- if we have it, you can use it. But if you want to buy it or if you want to, want to do something we don't have, we'll buy it. We'll just add it to the library. Because we want you to come together. That's what we need to do. We need to be walking like this, not like this. That's why we're, we're getting ready to start Celebrate Recovery right here. We're, we're going to be starting that up pretty soon. We got some, we, we're working on that, getting that process in place, getting everything lined up for that so that people with their hurts, habits, and hang-ups are, can come together and we can walk together and we can, we can, it's a Christian relationship that we can all come together and, and live together the way that God desires us to and the way he designed us to. That's why we do those things, because I truly believe Jesus would do those things. See, because I remember him gathering in houses. I remember him gathering in a temple, too, but he also gathered in houses. I, I seem to remember that. There were some Pharisees, these tax collectors, all these people. And yet we say, no, Sunday morning's all we need. And more and more people are saying we don't even need Sunday morning. Okay, so, so I've just, man, we need, to, we need to understand we need to come together. Don't push apart. When, we're go, when life sucks, when things are, are a struggle, we need to come together, not push apart. Let me close with this. Moses and the Israelites were, battled the uh, Amalekites um, back in Exodus 17, and I'm not going to go there and read it. I'm just going to paraphrase for you, but certainly go and read it. But see, here's the thing. Moses uh, um, sent Joshua down to, the, down to the valley to fight. He sent him down to lead the battle in the, in the, in the valley, and, and Mos- uh, uh, Moses went up the hill. He went up the hill uh, to pray. And, and, but he, he sent Joseph, or, uh, Joshua down with, with the army, so he's not alone fighting that battle. Moses went up the hill to pray, and he didn't go alone either. See, he took Aaron and her with him, as you may remember. See, so Moses is up on the hillside, and he's praising the Lord, and he's praying to the Lord. He's asking for assistance and all that stuff, right? 
And so he's up there, but his arms would get tired. And so Aaron and, and her were on either side of him. And, and, and as Moses' arms would sag, the army would start to lose. And they would lift his arms back up. They would bring, raise them back up for him that he would continue to pray the way he had been, praising the Lord and, and, and giving all sovereignty and all, all um, glory to the Lord, right? And, and, so, and then, as they would, then they would start losing, and they would help him back up again right and so he did, went up there the thing is he didn't go up there to pray by himself well we meet here every wednesday morning at 5 45 for prayer men's prayer right and so um we don't come here and pray by ourselves we come and pray together life groups better be praying together right that's that's foundational to a life group you got to start with prayer end with prayer right we, but we don't pray alone. We don't do it on our own. God is there with us and our brothers and sisters coming together. We don't do it alone. The army, the Israelite army, prevailed because Moses prayed. Guess what? Moses prayed because he had brothers with him helping him to pray. He didn't pray alone either. If he had been alone, his arms would have came down and the army would have lost. Think about that. I don't care if there's just a couple of us or there's an entire army of us. We need to be doing it together for the Lord. When you and I are down in that pit, we need brothers and sisters to come alongside of us and walk with us. We can't do it alone. We cannot do it alone. For you and I, we know Jesus. And so when we know Jesus, we know Jesus is in the bottom of that pit waiting for us because we know he's everywhere, right? How about our friends, those people that we, colleagues that we work with, whatever, the person, the waitress at the station, at the restaurant, the attendant at the gas station that doesn't know God, doesn't know Jesus, and we won't even do a Roman road, we won't even do an invite, we won't, we won't offer to pray with them, we won't offer to do anything for them, we just say, oh, no, go ahead and go to hell, because that's literally what we're saying, because we don't want to share our Jesus with them. When they're in the pit, they're by themselves. Do you know why? Because they don't even know Jesus, so they can't know that he's there. We know he's there. He's always there, and he's always waiting for us. Uh, Genesis 28, verse 15 says, I am with you and will watch over you wherever you go. I am with you and watch over you wherever you go. Is it only on the highs? Is it only on the highs? Is it in the pits? Is it everywhere? Amen. Amen. We're going to go to prayer. And after prayer, we're going to do the baptisms online, just so you know. Your video is going to get cut off um, because after, with the baptisms, we're not, we're not videoing that. Um, but I um, just want to share with you, as we, as we um, go to prayer now, let the Spirit speak to you and listen to him. Because I believe there's some more people in here that he's telling you it's time for you to stand up and tell the world Jesus is my Lord and Savior it's you're you're in that place where he's saying I want you to make that external uh, that 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 external um, exclamation about that internal transformation right this is it's time for you to declare make that declaration that Jesus is my Lord and Savior and I want the world to know it it's time to get baptized. Maybe during this prayer, you'll finally give in to him and start following him. Maybe during this time, you'll, you'll finally give your life over to the Lord. Maybe you've been arguing, you've been fighting, you've been resist resisting, right? I don't know. But you do. And so during this prayer, please allow the Holy Spirit to speak to you in that. Maybe you gave your life to Christ at one point in time, and then you went and you said, oh, I'm going to go this way now. And you walked away, and it's time for you to come back. Let the Spirit speak to you. Just let him speak to you and respond to him. Please join me as we go to our Lord. Dear Lord, thank you so very much. Father God, we just... Man, there's so much brokenness so much pain, there's so much sorrow 
There's so many who are stiff arming you. And Father God, we, they want to link arms, but they're afraid to. They're afraid to take that step. Father God, there's so many that are in pits and they don't know Jesus. There's so many that are in pits, they know Jesus, yet they don't want to, they don't want to talk to him. <clears throat> they resist him. There's so many who are struggling in so many different ways, Lord. And they think they're alone and they're not. Father God, there, there's so many who are struggling and in pain and in sorrow. And they got no one to turn to that they know of. But Father God, I ask that you would reveal to them right now I would, that your spirit would break them right now, that your, your spirit would pierce through the darkness that's going on right now, that your spirit instead would brighten up their hearts. Father God, I ask that you would help them, that, that right now you take away the chains, the bonds, that they would be willing to just break the chains and bonds, dear Lord. They'd be willing to stop saying no and say yes. Yes, Jesus, you are my Lord. Yes, Jesus, you are my Savior. Yes, Jesus, you're my Lord. I will follow you. I will die to self in this moment, in this time. I will die to self, and I will be born again in you because there's no other place I want to be. In this moment, Father God, I ask you to help them to see the light that your Son is, to see the light that your Spirit's been trying to show them. The light you've had shined all around them. And they were stuck in this dark little bubble. Father God, I ask you to burst that bubble. Don't just pick a little pinhole in it. Burst that bubble. And overwhelm them, overflow them with that beautiful bright light that you have for us all, dear Lord. I ask you to, to open hearts this morning. I ask you to open hearts, and I, say, I just say thank you, Lord. I thank you. I thank you. Thank you, Lord. I thank you for all you've already done. <clears throat> the blessings, the blessings you've given us, not just this morning through this message, not just this morning through this time, not just this morning through these opening hearts, but, Lord, through all the time, the blessing has been for me to be able to pastor this congregation. The blessing has been for me to be able to walk with people who are going through some stuff. Father God, I thank you. I thank you for allowing me to do what I do. I thank you for allowing each and every one of these people to do what you have them do. The ones who are following you, they're just like living it out. The ones who are just barely cracking the door. I thank you for them. Because if they don't crack the door, it can never be blown wide open. Father God, if we don't step up and step out, we'll never share your gospel, your good news. And Father God, I just thank you for the opportunities that we have. Just thank you so very much. And Father God, I look forward, I thank you in advance for what you're doing right now that I don't even know about, for what you're doing, that what's gonna happen yet today that I don't even know about. I thank you, Lord, for all, all that you do in and through each and every one of us. This, this, this bride of yours called Celebrate Church here in Canton, South Dakota, thank you. Thank you for the opportunities you continue to open for us in our community, reach our community, be Jesus to our community. Thank you. Thank you for that love, that overwhelming, that overflowing love, dear Lord. Thank you for the washing of our souls with your love, with the blood of your son. Thank you. Thank you so much. Father God, we're so blessed. We're so blessed. And we just say thank you and amen. Amen. I don't know where you're at, what you what you got going, right? What's going on in your heart. But we're gonna have uh, we have a song, and then during that and then after that song, we're gonna have the baptisms. And so in the meantime, if um if you're wanting to be baptized as well, again, my bride is in the back. She will set you up with stuff um, so that you're prepared, you're cared for in that way. And so, and if you need to talk to me, I'll be back there.
God, I'm on my knees again. God, I'm begging, please again. I need you. Oh, I need you. Walking down these desert roads, water for my thirsty soul. I need you. Oh, I need you. Your forgiveness It's like sweet, sweet honey on my lips Like the sound of symphony to my ears Like holy water on my lips Dead man walking, slave to sin I want to know about being born again I need you Oh God, I need you So take me to the riverside Take me under, baptize I need you Oh God, I need you Your forgiveness It's like sweet Honey on my lips Like the sound of the symphony to my ears It's like holy water on my skin I don't want to be your grace. God, I need it every day. It's the only thing that ever really makes me want to change. I don't want to abuse your grace. God, I need it every day. It's the only thing that ever really makes me want to change. I don't want to abuse your grace. God, I need it every day. It's the only thing that ever really makes me want to change. I don't want to be your grace. God, I need it every day. It's the only thing that ever makes me really want to change. Your forgiveness. Holy waters It's like sweet, sweet honey on my lips It's like the sound of symphony to my ears It's like holy waters on my lips It's like holy that have chosen uh, Christ today in their hearts as we baptize and prepare. Fellowship, if you'd like, you can gather your children and stay too. Um, they're playing a game, so they're completely fine uh, in the room as well. <laughs>